and welcome to today's Youth Salute Leadership Summit virtual program hosted by Asbury University. My name is Shelby Gonia and I am Asbury University's Visit Coordinator for Undergraduate Admissions. We're so honored to be part of this year's Youth Salute programming and hope that today's schedule allows you to expand your leadership skills and encourage you as you look at your next steps. Today's schedule includes the following. We'll have a personality assessment of the DISC profile system, which helps you recognize how you lead and work with others. We'll hear from current college students and what they would advise high school seniors to look forward to and maybe not be so nervous about. We'll have a session that encourages you as a leader in how you communicate with others. And then finally, we will hear from our Asbury University president, Dr. Kevin Brown. As you participate in today's schedule, we want to encourage you to sign up for a campus visit. You can scan the QR code with your phone at the bottom of the screen to register and secure your visit today. This will put you in a drawing for a VIP Asbury University visit package. So scan and sign up today. So without further ado, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's programming. My name is Mark Troyer. I'm our Vice President for Advancement here at Asbury University. Uh, this is my th about 35th year in higher, ed higher education administration. I've held a few different Vice President roles here. Um, have a PhD from University to Ken of Kentucky focused on leadership types things. And the thing that I love to do uh, the most is go around the world and help people figure out how to be, be in better teams. And that's some of what we're doing today. Uh, so thanks for tuning in. Uh, we're going to talk about the DISC assessment as part of this little seminar. You've taken that online, and we're going to talk about what that really means. Before I jump into this, there's a few disclaimers that I'd love to throw out there. First of all, I am a skeptic when it comes to assessments and putting ourselves in a box. I think we are way more complex than what any one assessment kind of gives us. However, I've also seen the use of these be a great lens through which to look at how we interact with other people, what are our tendencies, uh, how we solve problems together. So that's why I do this. I would encourage you to kind of operate here in this in a watermelon principle. So when you eat watermelon, there's some great meat in there, but there's also some seeds. Those seeds are things you might disagree with or wonder about. And if you can take away some meat from this, uh, that would be great. As we walk into this DISC assessment, uh, I want you to understand that it is really about your behavioral tendencies, the things that I kind of do without thinking about it, the, the things that I operate by on a normal basis. Um, I can do things a different way, but I have to think about it more. And these are behavioral tendencies. That's what kind of what this gets at. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we get into the assessment. Uh, I would also say that we are generally born with these tendencies. Um, I used to think that a lot of a personality of a person was based on their, their family. So if I was in a very organized family, I was organized. But I had twins 30 years ago. My wife and I had twins, and they came out of the womb differently. One of my sons, we would throw Cheerios on a tray, and they would pick those Cheerios up, and he would study them. He'd, he'd look around. He'd chew slowly, look out and get lost in his thoughts. And those Cheerios would last a half hour. The other son, born 10 minutes later, earlier actually, um, same mom, same dad, throw the same kind of Cheerios on the tray, and he would look at them and just go, <sighs> and those Cheerios would be gone in 10 seconds. That is a personality difference that showed up the rest of their life. And so now you can adjust that. If you're spontaneous, you can be more organized if you work at it. But what this gets at in this DISC assessment is a tendency in how I like to operate. Now, why study that some of this? The Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching did a study years ago, and they said 15% of the reason you get a job, keep a job, or move ahead in that job are your technical skills, the things that I know about accounting, the things that I know about teaching, the things I didn't know about media. 85% is what they found, 
is based on my interpersonal skills. Can I actually get along with the people that I work with? Can I actually budget my time well, problem solve with others that are around me? So that's part of the reason why we study these type of things. So as we walk into this uh, DISC assessment and how that impacts personality and leadership, uh, I want you to keep those things in mind. All right, as we get into the DISC, let me encourage you, I know you're at home. We, love, we wish you were here, by the way. Uh, but this is great to be able to interact with you this way. If you think about it and have it available, find a piece of paper. And there's going to be a couple reasons we do this. So find a piece of paper at home. Maybe it's the printout that you looked at when you took the assessment online. And uh, I realize most of you took the assessment online. There's a lot of different types you can do. So I'm going to give you just some of the basics here. But as we walk into this, uh, we're going to build kind of a personal profile of you that will be helpful. Almost every job interview you go to, you're asked your strengths and your weaknesses. This is one of those that'll help you with that. Um, but first of all, I want you to write down or think about people in your life you identify with the most often. And that could be brother, mom, best friend. Who are two or three you think about the most often or you, you, that you work with the most often? Okay, you got those in your head? Now, as you think about those two or three people, uh, some on that list you have really rewarding relationships, and some are really challenging. What makes the difference? Why do I get along really well with that person and maybe not as well with that person? What are the characteristics of an excellent relationship with another person? That might fall into the areas of, hey, I can listen well with them. We have things in common. We have shared experiences. We budget our time the same. We like the same music. Um, some of that may be related to personality, differences. And we're going to explore a little bit of that. So a couple principles as we get into this. First of all, every single person has some sort of strengths. They may not be the same, but we all have strengths. And what we ought to do is seek to maximize the use of those strengths in our interactions and the roles that we play and the jobs that we do. Find out what you do well and do more of it. And hopefully today we're going to help you understand that. On the flip side, every one of us also has weaknesses. Now, some of you out there think, I don't have as many weaknesses as they do, but we all have weaknesses, and we ought to seek to minimize uh, the use of those weaknesses and the impact of those weaknesses. But I, I want to do something here and help describe what a weakness is. Oftentimes, a weakness is simply a strength that's been pushed to an extreme. A strength that's been pushed to an extreme. So, if I'm a really organized person, that's a strength, right? What happens if I push that to an extreme? I can be too organized, that I can't make decisions, and anal retentive, and all kinds of things. So that strength of organization pushed to an extreme can become a weakness. Now flip that around. Let's say I'm really good with people, and that's a strength. I get along with people great. And, uh, but if I push that to an extreme, sometimes I'm so social I can't get my work done. So that's some of the principles as we talk about strengths and weaknesses and the different styles here, that oftentimes a strength or weakness is simply a strength pushed to an extreme. Now, to illustrate something, if you've got that piece of paper right there, what I'd love to have you do is take a pencil out or pen, put the pen in your opposite writing hand, and I want you to take five seconds and sign your name. Go ahead. Sign your name with your opposite writing hand. That's hard, and some of you will probably spell your name wrong. It'll look like you're in first grade. Now take your pen in your regular writing hand, close your eyes, and sign your name. A little easier. You can do that without thinking about it. That's kind of what happens with a personality assessment. There's things I do without even thinking about it. It's like signing your name with your regular writing hand. I can do those other things, but i got to think about it more. And some of you probably had your tongue sticking out when you were writing with your opposite writing hand. That's the principle as we walk into this that I want you to keep in mind. So everybody has a personal style. And what, what you're going to see be behind me here, I'm going to put some things up on the board that will help you. But you took an assessment online. That is your assessment. So what came out as results are based on what you put in. So if you were rushing and not paying much attention, it may not be as accurate. Uh, if you were in a hurry, it may not be as accurate, but what it will tell you is what you put into it. That's your assessment. And what we're going to do here is also have you self-validate the results. So as we walk through these, you're going you're to learn some things about yourself, 
self-validate that assessment by checking things off, writing some things down. So at the end of this section, uh, you will walk away with a personal profile of here's some of my strengths that I really agree with, here's some of my weaknesses. So we're going to walk into what are the dimensions of personal style. And on your screen will be a PowerPoint slide that lists a couple things. And I'm, I'm going to write these on the whiteboard because I'm going to refer to this. And so I'm going to walk over here and write some of these things down. Typically, we fall into a couple different categories. So we tend to either be people who are very purpose-driven, task goal-oriented, or we are people-driven. We love to hang out with people. We love to understand people. And that drives some of the decisions that we make and what we enjoy and what our tendencies and behavioral tendencies are. We also tend to fall out, and this is actually true in a lot of different assessments, this model. We tend to fall out as being either initiators or responders. Okay? We, we might be that person that says, hey, let's go make sure we do this. Or we might be that person that waits and lets other people make a decision, evaluate a little bit, and then decide. So we tend to fall out in one of those categories. And that is that those categories, if you remember nothing else, this will explain a lot of this assessment and what it looks like. So those of us who fall into the category of being very purpose-driven uh, will will come out as D's on this assessment, okay? And this is, this is mine, actually. I fall out as an initiator who's a D and an I, my highest and second highest point. Uh, I don't, one of the ways you can remember this is dominance. We like, we like to be in charge, oftentimes. If we're honest with each other, we like to be in charge. If I'm also an initiator, or, but, I, but I love being around people, that tends to be an I on this assessment. And we're going to call those initiators, OK? That's actually, uh, and another way to look at that is influencers. We love to influence things, especially around people. If you're on the people scale and you love to be around people, but you are more of a responder, those tend to be the S's on this survey, on this assessment. And one of the descriptors there is steadiness. We tend to be not rattled too much, uh, tend to be a little bit more steady in how we go about things. And then finally is our C's. The C's, like the D's, are very purpose-driven, goal-oriented. You probably have lists of the things you need to do. And if you do something on the, that wasn't on the list, you write it on the list and cross it off. Those are our C's. And oftentimes, the C's are conscientious. Okay? So that's, that's the basics with this assessment. And uh, what you saw on the online assessment are probably a high point or a couple high points on that. So as we walk through describing each of these, um, I want you to think about that we are, we are a caricature as we describe this. So if you're a high D, you're not all D. You have some other combinations. If you're a high I, you're not all I. But that may be a stronger tendency for you. So there's a percentage, depending on what assessment you took online, that'll give you that. The higher the percentage, the stronger that is. So that's the basics with this. And I'm going to refer back to this as we try to describe each one of these. All right, for this next section, we're going to have you build a little personal profile. So that piece of paper, if you have it, uh, I'm going to walk through kind of in a quick flyover, the D, I, S, and C, and have you self-validate, circle some things you really agree with, circum circle some things you don't agree with, or that you feel like might be weaknesses. And then we'll have you put all that in one place. Then we'll talk a little bit next about the details of each one of these. So first of all, the Ds. Remember, you're seeing something on your screen that probably looks at strengths and weaknesses of the D. Remember the Ds are really purpose focused and initiators. So some of those strengths are getting things done, taking charge, make quick, quick decisions. What I want you to do is take a look at those, circle your top two or three that you go, oh yeah, that's me. And if I ask my mom, that's me or my best friend. And then also circle 
two or three weaknesses on there. The weakness of a D is sometimes they're insensitive to others because they're trying to get things done or they're impatient or they're in inattentive to detail. So for you, if your high point on that assessment was a D, circle the top two or three things in strengths, top two or three things in weaknesses. If your second high point was a D, do the same thing. Then we go to the I, and it's somewhat similar. Now the I, remember, like the D, is an initiator, but they are motivated by their interactions with people. So strengths are being optimistic, personable, entertaining. So if your I was one of your top points, circle the top two or three things there in the strengths of an I. Now we all have weaknesses too, so the eyes are really focused on the people being initiators, but sometimes, and I'm an I, I'm a D and an I, sometimes we lack follow through, or we talk too much, or we verbally manipulate people if we're not careful and we're honest. So on that screen, so circle your top two or three as an I of your strengths and weaknesses that you would agree with, or that people that know you well would agree with. Now. My wife and I are actually opposite on all of these scales. So when I talk about the I and the D, it's me. When I get to the S and the C, that's my wife, Diane, who I love dearly. Uh, she is an S. And those of you who are S's, you're really focused on the people, but you're more responders. And the S's, the strengths are loyal, supportive, reliable, great listeners. They're good counselors. For those of you who are S's, and that's one of your top points, Circle the top strengths in that list. You also have some weaknesses, potentially. Sometimes over-tolerant, can't make decisions, procrastinators. So circle the top two or three things for you that are weaknesses. And then finally, on this quick flyover, the C's. These are our ordered people, conscientiousness. They like to get things done, so they're purpose-driven, but they're more methodical and responders. So some of those strengths that you see there are orderly, thorough, analytical, precise. Uh, circle for you if your top one or two is a C, three things that are strengths there. But then also look at the weaknesses. Sometimes they lack spontaneity. Sometimes are too detail oriented, uh, tend to be pessimistic rather than optimistic. So for you, asking those people who know you well, what would they say about you? So what we're trying to do then is translate those onto a kind of a summary. Uh, so on your piece of paper, and you may see online also, a, a summary that says, here are my tendencies. So just as self-validating on the quick flyover, these are the things that I feel like are my strengths because I came out in this assessment as a D or a C or an I or an S. And these are the things that are my weaknesses. So really quickly, what we're able to do is kind of build a personal profile for you. So as we walk into a little bit deeper look at each of these styles, you may adjust some of those, but what, what you have in front of you, if you've done that, and you can go back and do it later, is basically what people are going to ask you in a job interview. What do you feel like are some of your strengths? What do you feel like are some of your weaknesses? And as you describe your weaknesses, remember, you can say, you know what, I'm a procrastinator, but that's a, that comes out of my strength of wanting to do things right. So a weakness is a strength pushed to an extreme. So that's one of the things that comes out of this. So next, what we're going to walk into is a little bit deeper dive into each of these styles. And uh, what I want you to keep in mind is what's behind me, which is the basics of how this assessment is set up. And it'll make a little bit more sense as we walk into each one of these. All right, as we, as we walk into the details of each of these letters in the disk, they're really different in a variety of ways. Uh, they're going to be different in the motivation that we have and what motivates us as a person in the situations that we just thrive in, in what we accept and reject in other people, what strengths and weaknesses are, how we do time management, how we make decisions. So we're going to get into a little bit of the details of that. But what I want you to continually remember is the basics of the chart. So I'm either purpose driven or people driven. That has an impact on how I like to make decisions. I'm an initiator or a responder. That has an impact on how I like to spend my time. Um, it's interesting too that people who come into our life oftentimes are different than us. And in building stronger relationships, 
it's helpful it's helpful to understand my own style but also value that style of another person so as you think about this you may even think about somebody in my life who might be different than me how can I value what they bring to the table even if it's different than my own style and it's also re important to recognize that those differences oftentimes complement each other so my wife is incredibly organized and I'm kind of a spur-of-the-moment person and we've learn to complement each other in that. It took some time, uh, but working together on that has led to 33 years of marriage, uh, which is great. Um, and But being committed to building others up by what we say and what we do based on even their needs is really important. So as we go into the details of each of these, what I want you to remember is I'm either purpose-driven or I'm people-driven. I tend to be either an initiator or a responder. So right now we're gonna talk about the D's. And those of you who scored high on the D's, uh, there are specific things that show that, hey, you're purpose-driven initiators. And I'm gonna walk through those. So as you see those on the, on the PowerPoint, you'll see some of the details. So those of us who are D's, those of you who are D's, our basic motivation oftentimes are results and challenge. Best way to get a D to do something is tell them they can't do it. It's that purpose-driven, get it done, um, so best situation, obviously, is continual challenges. But you got to give me some freedom to actually get it done if you're going to challenge me to do something. That's a D. We love variety. Uh, we accept difficult tasks, but it will drive us crazy if there's people in our sphere who are not, not doing their job or not going with us. So we like to, to have that challenge and that goal. So remember the difference between a strength and a weakness a weakness is a strength pushed to an extreme. So if you look at the D, major strengths, they're going to get things done. They're going to be decisive. They're going to be persistent. They're going to keep trying if they, if they fail. Now, push that to an extreme, what it can mean is sometimes we can be insensitive to other people in order to get it done. Oh, come on, just, just oh, I know it's hurt your feelings, but we got to get this done. That sometimes is what we can be as Ds. We can be impatient. We can be inflexible. Under tension, if we are not careful, those of us who are Ds, because we're so focused on getting those things done and, and having a challenge and have, getting, getting the results, is that we can become autocratic. Uh, we can become ordering people around. You do this, you do this, you do this. What we would benefit more from is slowing down and listening. And so that comes out of that focus on being an initiator and trying to get things done. So ideal world for a D is where they have control. We, if we admit it, we like to control things. And we like to change things, sometimes just for change's sake, which, is, which drives other people crazy if we're not careful. We want to do it my way. And greatest fear sometimes is losing control or not having a challenge. Ds bore easily. And sometimes they want to try something new just for the sake of trying it and doing it. I, I had a college student one time that was going to go to Florida on spring break. He was a strong D, and he decided, you know what? I think it would be more fun to hitchhike. He hitchhiked all the way to Florida just because it was a challenge. That's, that's kind of a summary of the D. And you may have people in your life who are strong Ds and goal-oriented, and it may be that dad who wants to drive 100 miles before he stops for, to let anybody go to the bathroom. You know, it's that goal. Goal-oriented is really strong in the Ds. Now, let's shift to the next one, which is our eyes. Eyes are also initiators around people-oriented things. So similar to the D, the eyes love to initiate things, but they're often motivated by people and their interactions with people. Well, that shows up in the things that they're motivated by. So if you take a look, basic motivation of an eye is recognition and approval. I love other people recognizing that I've done something well. I love to get the approval of my family, my friends. To get an eye to do something, give them a certificate. Thank them. Be, let them know that that was appreciated. That people side is really an important motivating factor for an eye. So best situation, they love the opportunity to motivate others. New and exciting opportunities. But they aren't quite as strong on the detail and they don't like the control of others, and the follow-through isn't quite as strong sometimes. They love 
uh, involvement with others. What is really hard for an eye is probably what you're going through right now in isolation and not being around people. Probably as an eye, this COVID thing is incredibly difficult uh, because they love being with people. So strengths, I love having an eye on a team. They are optimistic. They're enthusiastic about the next thing. They love getting along with others and they're personable. So an eye love, loves to meet people in a crowd and loves to meet new people. Sometimes if they're not careful, the weakness part of that is they can oversell things or become manipulative or not follow through. The caricature of an eye is a used car salesman and they're, they're trying to sell you a car and this is a great car and I know it doesn't have an engine but it gets great mileage when I'm pushing it down the road and you get good exercise with this car. An eye sees the glass half full and that's a strength. Sometimes they can oversell things if they're not careful. So under tension, and this is an interesting one, if I'm not getting that recognition and approval, under tension, sometimes the eye, if they're not careful, can attack other people. So if you're walking out of this seminar with me and you say, you know what, that was the biggest waste of an hour that I ever had, and I'm an eye, what am I not getting? I'm not getting recognition or approval of the time I just spent. And my, my gut reaction might be to say, well, if you paid attention, you got something out of it. That's that attacking. We got to be careful, those of us who are eyes, that that doesn't come out. Therefore, we would benefit from pausing, listening a little bit more. It's that if I'm an initiator, my benefit would be to be a little bit more of a responder in the t areas that cause tension. So ideal world for an eye is they have fun. Eyes enjoy being the life of the party, organizing people. They like to try and dream things. Uh, eyes, oftentimes we have more ideas than we will ever be able to pull off. But that is a strong eye. They want to do it the exciting way. Wow, well, we've tried it this way before. Let's try it a little bit differently. Let's change the rules of this board game. Let's change the rules of this game that we're playing. Greatest fear is losing face or not having social approval. So for people to, to not appreciate what I'm doing or my friends and I aren't getting along, that's a difficult thing for an eye. So if you're working with people, or if you're in a group with people, recognize that for an eye, those interactions and those relationships are really, really important. So those are the D and the I who both serve as initiators and similar to the I's, but as responders are our S's. And they both love interactions with people. People motivate what they do, but it shows up differently because the I's are initiators and the S's are responders. The S's tend to be a little bit more steady. And if you look at what motivates an S, it is relationships and appreciation. Now, an S may appreciate it more if you're walking down the hallway and you put your arm around them and say, you know what, I just love this relationship that we have. That means a lot to an S. And I would feel great about that too, but they would love a standing ovation. Let me have a hundred people standing and give me and clapping for me and saying, "This, you did a great job." An S, it's that intimate relationship. Sometimes are more motivating. So, best situation for an S is an opportunity to serve others, a stable and predictable environment, friendly, peaceful environment. People are getting along together uh, because I can predict that. I can respond to that. Um, they accept friendships, love friendships, but conflict is really hard for those of you who are an S. And sometimes those of you who are S's, because that relationship is so important, someone might say, hey, is everything okay? And you might on the outside say, oh yeah, everything's fine. But inside you're going, well, of course it isn't okay. You didn't notice that last week? So S's have to be careful that they are being a little bit more open with how they're really feeling and that their friends understand that. Uh, the strengths for an S, love having S's on a team. They're supportive, agreeable, loyal to a group, loyal to a job, loyal to uh, a team, and S's are great to have on a team. The weakness on an S, sometimes that loyalty can become indirect with others for the sake of maintain that, man maintaining that relationship, or they can be overly tolerant if they're not careful. Um, under tension, uh, an S oftentimes, this is like a $5 word, will acquiesce, which means I won't really tell you what I feel or think, but I'll kind of go along. 
and therefore they would benefit. That's a, that's a responder uh, task. They would benefit from initiating more as an S. Uh, as you are, as we're walking through this, I hope that you're kind of writing down some things and, and honing that personal profile that you wrote down early, or that you're thinking about, hey, that friend of mine might be this, or my, my dad may, might be this. That's some of the most rewarding pieces when you start to realize, hey, we're just wired a little bit differently. How can we get along a little bit better? Now, the, the ideal world for an S is where they have peace. The birds are singing. Everybody's getting along. Uh, there's no conflict. That is perfect for an S because those relationships are so important. They like to watch things. Uh, if those of you who are S's out there and you scored really strong, I'll bet if I had you in here and I asked you this question, you would say yes. Have you ever just sat at the mall and watched people and said, oh, those two aren't getting along very well. Oh, that's a, a mother and a dad. They really love each other. S's are great observers. They love to watch things. They want to do it the easy way, which is interesting because some of you who are D's and I's right now, when I said easy way, you're going easy way. Take a challenge. Well, part of why the S wants to do it the easy way is it's more predictable. The outcome is more something I can say this is going to happen. Uh, so that easy way is more stable, and that is a strength of an S. Their greatest fear is losing stability or losing a relationship. So when relationships aren't going well, sometimes those of us who are Ds, we can plow through because we're trying to get things done. For an S, it's a big deal. And how I interact, interact in a team and how, how I interact with people depends on me understanding some of these things. All right, and finally, the C's. My wife is a C. This is one of my favorites because I am the least C, uh, but I love C's. C's, like the D, are very purpose-driven. They're people that have lists and goals and or are ordered, but they're also responders. They're a little slower, methodical in how they go about life. They're conscientious. So the C's, because of that motivation, basic motivations for a C is to be right. And they will have done their homework and to do things well and quality. C's are people who enjoy doing things well. And sometimes they are, are perfectionists. Uh, best situation for a C is clearly defined goals, clearly defined objectives, but limit the risk because I don't want to fail. So I need to know what the objectives are. If, I need, if I'm going to write a paper and you tell me to do it on my favorite subject, as a C, does that paper need to be five pages, six pages, 12 point font, black, red, uh, blue font, letters? Uh, what does it look like? Because they want to do it well. And that's a C, and they do things well. They generally do things very well, but those clearly defined goals, objectives, job descriptions are really important for a C based on this. What they accept is methods and structure. Uh, what they cannot stand, those of us who have friends that are Cs, is lack of quality. So if, I've, if I'm in a group project and somebody's a slacking, that will drive a C crazy. Uh, so what are the major strengths of a C? It becomes fairly obvious. They're orderly, they're thorough, they're analytical. You want a C on your team if you're doing a group project because they're going to make sure you're doing it well. That is a strength of the C. Now, on the flip side, if they push that too far, then it can become a weakness and they can lack spontaneity. Um, I actually did this with some couples. We had two engineers in the room. They were both strong C's and they realized this about each other and they, and they kind of hung their head and chuckled and they said, we've realized that we need to be more spontaneous. So what we do is in our calendar on Friday nights, we write in spontaneous time. And that, that is a C. They realize about themselves that they're not, but they try to be and they organize it in such a way that they are. Uh, sometimes the C's can be too detailed or too cautious to make a decision. Oftentimes the C's don't have enough data to make a good decision, but they're forced into making the decision because they want to make the right decision. So under tension, when things are not going well or quality, a C might tend to avoid the situation. So if you're a C and you find yourself avoiding the situation, think back, okay, what would be beneficial? And maybe it would be beneficial for me to declare how I'm really thinking and really feeling on this. Um, 
ideal world for a C is where they have excellence. Whether it's my team, my family, my friends, things are going really, really well. Uh, they like to research things. Uh, a C is somebody who doesn't mind going online and finding the best college. Of course, Asbury is the best college. I do work here. We would love to have all of you come. Uh, but they are researchers just by nature. They enjoy doing that. My wife will look at all the different options for car insurance and find the best one. And a friend of mine used to call and say, hey, yours is due about the same time as ours. I know Diane's already done all this. What's the best deal? I C's love finding that. They want to do it the right way, and their greatest fear is being wrong or being criticized because they're so focused on doing things well and they work so hard at that. So if you're going to tell a C that isn't, it isn't right, don't tell them that you just don't think it's right. you got to give them why because they will have worked at it a lot. So that's kind of an overview that of the D and the I and the S and the C that I hope you're able to see yourself in there somewhere. And it's important to understand that we're created a little bit differently and that we come at life a little bit differently just naturally. And it doesn't mean I can't operate that other way, but it might be like writing with my opposite writing hand. I have to think about it a little bit more. It takes a little bit more time. So as a professional and as you start to lead, you need to learn some of the skills in the other area. Some of those skills are going to come naturally for you. For your friend, those skills may be very different. So part of the point of this and why do we even do this in leadership is your life is going to be filled with interactions with other people, whether it's a spouse, a friend, a family member, a team, your organization. It's really, really important that from a leadership perspective, you understand how you're created and you how you operate, what your strengths and weaknesses are, and how that inter interacts with those people that are on your team how you're able to lead that person. If I have someone on my team who needs detail and I don't give them detail, that's gonna be hard for them to operate well. So my objective is to understand the people that are around me and frame how I interact with them in a way that makes them better. And the first step of that is understanding myself. So I hope you've got a little bit of a chance to unwrap this a little bit. And again, as I said, uh, I'm a skeptic when it comes to these. There's some seeds you want to spit out with the watermelon, but hopefully there's some pieces here that can make you a better leader. So I appreciate you tun tuning in. As we conclude this, I hope you've gotten just a little bit of a window of how you were created, what some of your tendencies are, whether you remember the DIS or C or not, uh, isn't as important as remembering that you are created very differently and special and that other people may come at things in a different way. Why is that important? As you go in and lead, as you go in and build relationships with friends, colleagues, teammates in your organization, you're going to need to have some of these skills to understand why are they making decisions different than I am? Why are they, their time management is different than mine? Uh, those are important skills to learn and it allows you to build a better, better team. It allows you to understand yourself. It allows you to understand and make people better around you. As you work with others, as you lead others, the team will be better if I understand how that person ticks and if I understand how that person is created and how I need to adjust my behavior to bring out the best in them. As a society, we need this type of skill. And to understand yourself is a really important piece of this. So I appreciate you tuning in. I hope this has been helpful. I would encourage you to go out there and lead well. Hi, I'm Grace Raisin. I'm a psychology major. And if there's one thing that I wish I could go back in time and tell myself as a freshman would be that it is totally okay to ask for help. I'm a very independent person. I like to do things myself and that kind of gets me into trouble because when I don't know what's going on, I like to just try to figure it out rather than asking for assistance. So freshman year, I could not figure out how to get from chapel to one of my classes right afterwards without going outside, walking around the whole building, coming back inside, and I didn't ask any of my classmates how they were getting there until like halfway through the semester, one of my friends was like, hey, did you know this other way to get to class? 
And that was just a moment of realization for me, like how much easier could this whole time have been if I would have just asked somebody. I promise the upperclassmen are not that scary. They will help you. Um, so definitely, I, I wish I would have just been open to asking for help. I would also really recommend checking your email. That is the primary way that professors will communicate with you. So download the app, turn on the notifications. Uh, that is really important to have. Hey, my name is Joel Fletcher. I am a junior at Asbury University. I'm a major in media communications with emphasis in film production. Um, one thing I wish I knew as a senior getting ready to graduate and go into college is that um, professors aren't as scary as you would think they would be. I kind of thought they were these, this scary teacher that was just going to give me bad grades and all that, and that's just not true. Um, they really want to work with you, they're very approachable, and they actually want you to just reach out, introduce yourself. So don't be afraid to go up to them after a class or send them an email and just say, hey, this is what I'm passionate about, this is why I'm taking your class, thanks for being an awesome professor. And they'll love that. Um, one piece of advice I have for you, especially as leaders getting ready to go onto a college campus, is don't be afraid to say no. You're going to be, you're going to be presented with so many different cool, unique opportunities, and just, they're just going to be flying at you right and left, and just be prepared to be able to say no. Make sure to take the opportunities that you want to, but also, you don't have to say yes to everything. Hello everyone, my name is Madeline Howard. I'm currently a sophomore here at Asbury University. I'm an equine studies and English double major. And I just wanted to spend a little time with you guys today, encouraging you in something that I wish I knew when I was a senior in high school. The first thing that I want to remind you guys is that you don't have to be feeling this pressure to choose your career path right now. I know a lot of times in middle school and high school, they make you choose a career path and you take a lot of classes related to that. But don't feel that pressure. You don't need to be feeling that. Once you get to college, if you come to Asbury, we have a bunch of foundational classes where you just get an introduction to a bunch of different areas that you could study here. You have to take a few public speaking classes, English, science, and math, and it really just gives you that mindset to decide what exactly you wanna spend your time on while you're here in college. The next thing that I wanna encourage you guys with once you actually get onto a college campus is to really get involved. I know, Freshman year can be really scary for a lot of people. It feels lonely, you're in a totally new environment, you don't really know what's going on. Um, but the best thing that you guys can do is go find some activities and clubs that you might want to invest your time in while you're here. I know that's where I made most of my friends. I'm out of the barn a lot because I have a horse out there and I'm on a few of the clubs and teams out there. And if I didn't have those, I wouldn't have the connections that I have now. So I'd really encourage you guys to take a step out of your comfort zone. I struggle with it still but it's the best thing that you can do for your freshman self. Hi, I'm Jim Shores. I chair the communication program at Asbury University where we have a leadership major. And so I've been asked to speak today about leadership communication. Now, uh, maybe you have been elected to student council or you, you found yourself suddenly, I'm captain of the soccer team and I don't know how to communicate with these people well. You're head of the French club, the drama club. What do you do to create a sense of unity with your team? How do you communicate well with them so that you can lead them to accomplish their goals and you guys to be a competitive, well-functioning organization? Well, that's what we're gonna talk about today. So I hope you enjoy this as we look at three key principles. So our three principles of communication that we're gonna talk about today, and there are many we could talk about. Three though, the first one is called dialogic communication, which I'm gonna explain to you in two seconds, so hang in there with that. The second one is the idea of building a collaboration instead of being in competition with those people that you're leading. It's not about you winning, it's about you creating a team. And then the third point is just active listening. How do you listen well so that you can create dialogue and come up with long-term solutions? So dialogic communication is the idea of speaking in a way that the other person feels like they can listen and listening in a way that they feel welcomed to speak. So let me say that again, speaking in a way they can listen, listening in a way they can speak. If I have my arms crossed and I'm looking at you with this type of face and I'm like, yeah, tell me another thing, 
I don't feel invited to speak, right? And the same is true if I'm listening to you and I'm like, mm hmm, yeah, right. I don't want to speak. So in conversations, we create our own social realities uh, and they in turn bounce back and we have to live in those social realities. So every single conversation, it has an afterlife. Well, what does that have to do with leadership? Well, if I think that as a leader, I can just say things, I have to realize that they affect people and those, they bounce back and they affect me and they affect the entire team. And this is called social construction. The idea that uh, I create the worlds through my words that I'm now gonna have to live in. I mean, have you ever told your brother, your sister, or friend that they're stupid? I'm sure it didn't end there. I'm sure they, in turn, told you that you were stupid. And uh, if you've ever told a friend that they're your best friend or they're amazing or you really think a lot of them, if you told your mom and dad that you love them, you probably had a different outcome, right? So body language, tone of voice, what we say, these are all incredibly important. In fact, it's been said 40% of what we say is our body language. Another 40% is our tone of voice. Only 20% is the actual words that we say out loud. So how people communicate is oftentimes more important than what they actually say. And this is called logical force. Um, the idea that when I speak, there's a force behind what I'm saying. There's this pressure for you to respond in like manner. So if I am talking to you like this, pointing a finger, uh, being negative, there's a logical force that you're going to cross your arms, you're going to get defensive, and you're going to talk to me like this as well. And we're not going to be able to create a team uh, in that situation. So that concept of reflexivity, there's your 50 cent college word for the day. Reflexivity is the idea that our words, they go out and they affect others, but then they bounce back and they affect us as well, or they affect the entire team. You know, in, um, in the Christian, Judeo-Christian tradition, uh, in the Bible, it says uh, God spoke the universe into being. Well, we're not God, but I think we are able to create or speak certain social realities into being. And so we better be careful what we're speaking, uh, how we're standing, what our tone of voice is, so that we welcome good communication. So what happens when we're negative? Things get negative. And what happens when we're positive? Things hopefully get positive. I love this uh, photograph at the bottom there. I think that's pre-COVID-19. I don't think they're exercising social distancing very well. But the main idea behind all of this is this concept that as leaders, we want to become a curious participant in the other person's reality. That's a very important concept. It's not about winning or losing. It's about being a curious participant in the other person's reality. Why is that important? Well, how can I lead you effectively if I don't know who you are? If I haven't really heard you? If I haven't made the effort to look out at the world through your eyes? Then I don't know what you value. I don't know what your hopes are. I don't know what you want to accomplish. And also, I think at the end of the day, if we're a part of a team, we're leading that team, it is so much more fun to lead that team if I know who you are. If I have taken time to listen to you and looked out at the world through your eyes. So that is the idea of dialogic communication. Speaking in a way that other people feel like they can listen, welcoming them listening in a way that other people feel like they can speak, and then the idea of being a curious participant in the other person's reality. That's dialogic communication. So we just talked about dialogic communication, but the purpose of that is so that we can hear each other and build collaboration, build a team. We don't want to be in competition with our own team. I've got two pictures up here. One is of a lovely young lady in front of a mirror, probably getting ready to perform or to go out for a date. Uh, she's concerned about how she looks and appropriately so. 
And then at the bottom, we've got a picture of people helping one another up onto a mountain. They're pulling each other up, they're holding hands, they're really acting as one unit, as a team. Why do I have those pictures here? Well, as a team leader, I don't wanna be in competition with the people that I'm leading. It's not about making yourself look good, right? They're not your supporting cast to make you look good, like the lady in the mirror here. Uh, if you are in leadership to look good or to have power or because it makes you feel good about yourself, those really aren't good reasons to be in leadership. A leader has to be attentive to the needs of the team, of their followers, so that they can serve them well. This concept is called servant leadership. Uh, so I understand how to provide you with the resources that you need so that you can be successful and the whole team can accomplish what it needs to accomplish. So it's really about working together to achieve these things. Whatever we've set out our goals to be, it's about achieving those things. You're just the one leading the charge, right? You might get to make some final decisions. You're leading the charge, but you're not the only one uh, making this happen. Everybody else is working with you to make this happen. So to, to ensure that this happens, what you wanna hold are strategic conversations with the group. A strategic conversation is composed of three elements. The first one is to ask questions, right? To get information from them, actively listening to other people to understand their values, their needs, their personal goals, their desires, like what do they wanna get out of this? Why did they, they sign up for the soccer team, the French club? Uh, why are they in student government? Or if you represent them, what do they actually need? So you listen to them, but there's another piece to this. You set the agenda for the conversation. That's your job as the leader. What are the strategic things that we have set in mind to accomplish these goals? What are the themes that we have to enact to accomplish, to get to where we need to be? So you are keeping the conversation on those things. And then finally, select the right communication channel for these people because sometimes uh, older people might prefer face-to-face -face conversation or a phone call and not appreciate texting back and forth and vice versa. A younger person might appreciate texting really quickly, but they don't wanna talk on the phone. So what is their preferred channel of communication and how can you use that well to facilitate dialogue? And so all of this contributes to what's called open communication, that you're not uh, holding certain bits of information as a secret, but that you can appropriately share all the information that you can uh, throughout the organization and across all levels of the organization. I mean, understandably, sometimes as a leader, you're at a you, you're talking about a decision that can't be released yet. It's not even uh, been enacted. You can't tell other people about it yet, but appropriate information that should be shared needs to be shared at all levels of the organization. And you wanna communicate with everyone and you wanna communicate often you're gonna to have to communicate more times than you think. If you send one email and half the people don't read it, don't get frustrated, just send the email again and make sure that you're communicating through the mode of uh, communication that they prefer. But what's the benefit of all this, of this open communication? Well, you're gonna have trust with one another. You're not going to be tense. You're not going to have conflict between people. Instead, you're gonna remind yourself that uh, all of us are committed to accomplishing this one larger vision, and it's gonna make our organization or our team more competitive. If I'm captain of the soccer team, I want our soccer team to be functional, right? So that we defeat other teams. We don't defeat ourselves through bad communication. And if I'm head of the theater program, I wanna make sure we put on just these astonishing plays that we're a well-oiled machine rather than having infighting and backbiting through poor communication with one another. So some questions that you might ask. I've got these divided up into two groups. I've called one leader-centered questions you might ask, and the other one's follower-centered. 
both are good. One is not better than the other, as you will see. So I might call a meeting as a leader and I might need to get information from people. Uh, in this case, I'm gonna seek, th this is information that's gonna inform me about what's going on in the organization, right? Uh, maybe I'm investigating a specific issue or a problem that's come up or an opportunity that we have and I'm getting your take on this. I'm gathering information, ideas, and insights from you. I'm extracting stuff from the group as the leader. But if I only ever do that, eventually people are going to start to feel a little bit used. And so what I also have to ask are things that, um, that bring me into a sense of fellowship with the group. You know, I really want to connect with you. So I'm just going to ask you about you, right, without any other agenda. Uh, and what this does, it helps me develop new insights about the group, the needs of the group, as we talked about earlier. It encourages critical thinking. Uh, if the whole group is listening to one another, you're going to hear some things you didn't know as a group. Uh, and that's going to expand other people's awarenesses within the group, of needs within the group, and it's going to stimulate learning. And all of that coming together, this sense of I need to accomplish tasks, but I also need to create a sense of cohesion, is going to yield long-term solutions. Now, sometimes, though, you have to exercise candor. What's that? No, it is not a South American bird. That's a condor. The candor is being honest. It's being candid with other people. So what if you're in a situation as a leader where somebody wants to do something that is unfair to others? It's just selfish, goes against policy, or uh, promotes their project to the detriment of other people's projects. You have to be honest with them and tell them the truth. You want to do so as kindly as possible. You want to be polite about it. But sometimes you have to say, hey, I've listened to you. I've heard you. I've heard your stories. And what you want to do is actually selfish. And we're not going to do that. Or what you want to do goes against policy. We can't do that. Or what you want to do is going to use up all the resources for your project. And the other person's project's not going to be successful. So you have to be honest with people. Hearing other people's stories, engaging in dialogic communication is not just a mutual admiration society. Uh, it is there to gather information so that you can lead well. So our third principle of good communication leadership is active listening. We've actually already kind of been talking about this with dialogic communication, but let's get into like, what is active listening? It's exactly what it says. It's fully concentrating on what is being said so that you can grasp the message's genuine meaning. It sounds like the easiest thing in the world to do. It's actually very difficult because you know in conversation half the time, if you're honest, you sort of listen to the beginning of what somebody's saying and then you've stopped listening to build your rebuttal for what they're saying or you're going to add a story to it we don't actually just listen all the way to the ends of people's sentences. And so to, to do this, the keys to effective listening are actually listening all the way through, uh, keeping an open mind so we're not making the mistake of thinking we know where this is going before we actually know where it's going, resisting distractions, so put your phone away, close your laptop, and then four, doing a gut check to really make sure, am I seeking to understand this person right now or am I mad at them and I'm just listening to them until I can argue or I'm overwhelmed with something else that's going on in my life and I'm not capable of really listening and understanding. Are you there to listen and to understand? And if you are, then you can engage in dialogue. Two people talking, but two people talking and really listening to each other. And dialogue is a great tool for hot button issues where things have gotten emotionally loaded and it's difficult for people to talk. It might even be such that you have to take something like, oh, this water bottle, right? And I hold this in my hand and while I'm holding it, I talk and the other people cannot interrupt me. And then once I'm done and I feel like I've said everything that I need to say, I hand it over to the other person and now they hold the water bottle and they get to talk and I cannot interrupt them. 
and we paraphrase one, what one another said. I get the water bottle back and I say, okay, what I think you said is this. I hand the water bottle back and they get an opportunity to correct me. Well, you got most of that right, but actually, no, that, I wasn't meaning that. I was meaning this. You do this silly exercise back and forth until both people feel like they've actually been heard and that the other person understands them well. And you would be so surprised in a hot button situation where everybody's tense, the tension goes out of the room, understanding happens, and now you can work on the issue. So, uh, but you gotta refrain from presuming to know the outcome of this conversation and trying just to sell your convictions. And that's awfully tasty, but you gotta resist that urge. So the enemies of good dialogue, they are talking more than you listening. You know, I mean, that's so easy to do, right? Being rushed for time. Sometimes we're not in control of that, but sometimes we've set up a meeting where we're like, okay, I got 15 minutes to deal with this big issue. Allow space. Focus on, if you're too focused on your own interests, you're not going to be able to hear the other person well. So again, going back to becoming a curious participant in the other person's reality, you're going to set aside your stuff. You're going to listen for a while. Maybe they're still wrong. Maybe you're still right, but you've really, really now heard them. But chances are there's something about what they're saying that's right too. Uh, engaging in defensive listening, again, where your arms are crossed and you're like, yeah, right. Assuming you have the right answers and just being in a posture of persuading and selling and finding the flaws in the other person's argument. You're not gonna listen well in those situations. It's been said that it's better to build a camel than a racehorse. What does that mean? Well, the camel looks like an animal that was built by committee, right? So one person on the committee was like, I think it should have a hump. Another person's like, I think it should have a really weird flat feet. Another person's like, it should have a really wide, strange nose. A racehorse, is one beautiful creature that uh, looks like it's the idea of one person, right? But if that one person gets their racehorse into the game without, and ignores all of the, uh, the, the suggestions that were given to you by your team, the team gets mad and they do not have a vested interest in your racehorse crossing the finish line. Instead, they're probably gonna be actively engaged in taking down your racehorse. So a camel is slow, but if everybody's ideas are adhered to that camel, everybody's cheering that camel on, and you're gonna come up with a long-term solution that is gonna cross that finish line. So instead, slow down and listen. Listen more than you talk. Focus on the big picture. What are we all here for in the first place, right? At the end of the day, what's the soccer team here for? What's the drama team here for? What is, student what is the student body here to accomplish? Seek the common good. Be kind to each other. Be polite. Be good people to one another, even if you're disagreeing on some things. Many people have pieces of the answer. Right? I have been in so many situations as a leader where I thought, I've got it. I've got the answer. People just need to listen to me. But if I've taken the time to listen, I realize, oh, I did not know about this. They have a piece of the answer that I needed. And if I hadn't listened, I would not have known it. And they saved me time and trouble. So make sure everybody gets heard. And that will allow you to see the bigger picture and come up with those long-term solutions that will make your organization or your, your team successful. So, what have we talked about? Three principles of leadership communication, dialogic communication, speaking in a way that other people can, can talk, and talking in a way that other people feel like they can listen. Number two, uh, building a collaboration and not being in competition with the people that you're supposed to be leading. It's not about you. It's about you serving them. And then finally, active listening so that you can engage in dialogue and come up with good ideas and long-term solutions that everybody can celebrate. Again, get that camel to cross the finish line, not your one beautiful racehorse. So 
I am Jim Shores. I uh, teach in communication at Asbury University, uh, where we have a leadership major, and I have so enjoyed spending time with you. If you have any questions, feel free to email me at jim.shores at asbury.edu, and thank you for your time. Thank you so much for joining us today for our Youth Salute Leadership Summit with Asbury University. We're so glad that you're able to take time today to um, listen and hope that these videos were helpful in um, just helping you to curate and define your skills for, for leading others in high school, college, and beyond. We also want to say a thank you to the Holly Fields for allowing us to be a part of this year's programming. Though we weren't able to host you on campus, we're so glad that we could still do this virtually with you. As we transition out of our leadership sessions, I want to encourage you to come and visit Asbury University, especially if you're still looking for your college home. So come um, schedule a visit with us via our website or giving us a phone call as we'd love to connect you with our faculty, staff, and students. Right now, we're going to transition to hearing from our Asbury University President, Dr. Kevin Brown. After he speaks, we're going to move on to our award ceremony. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Greetings everyone, my name is Kevin Brown. I serve as the 18th president of Asbury University. We are occupying a very unique moment right now. Some say that the global pandemic will forever change the world around us. However, others say the global pandemic is simply accelerating change that was already inevitable. Let me provide some examples. One reputable institution says that in the year 2030, 85% of the jobs that will exist then do not exist today. Many economists say that we're moving out of a manufacturing economy into what can be described as a service or a creativity economy. We know that automation will be disruptive over the next 5, 10, and 15 years. And of course, we are in the information age, where information is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So what does this mean for education? It means that it is no longer about the transaction of information, but rather it's about knowledge and it's about wisdom. As we foray into this future, what is necessary to be successful? Well, I could say a lot of things, but one will be leadership. And not just any leader, but individuals and leaders who are adaptable, flexible, leaders who can inspire, leaders who are creative. In other words, education needs to be rigorous, it needs to be relevant and uniquely equipped to provide students with the requisite skills necessary to navigate the complexities of a fast, dynamic, information-saturated, technology-driven global marketplace. We don't know what 2030 or 2040 or 2050 is going to be like, but we do know that individuals who possess these skills, skills such as critical thinking, problem solving, judgment, decision-making, the ability to communicate effectively, the ability to collaborate, and of course, a service orientation as well. The students who possess these skills will be relevant, whatever the character of the future. In other words, these skills are perennial and they will outlast the dynamism of tomorrow's fast labor market. These are the skills leaders need to have in order to move into the future and be successful. I want you to be one of those leaders and I want you to find an educational institution that will provide you with that training, those skills, that upbringing, that cultivation, and that wisdom in order to lead others into the future. Congratulations to you. I hope you finish your year well, and I hope to see you on our campus sometime. Thank you. Hello and welcome high school leaders, family and friends to the 40th annual Youth Salute Award Ceremony. My name is Andrea Wonker. I'm the morning show anchor at WKYT and I'll be serving as your co MC for today's event alongside my coworker Amber Philpott, who'll be joining us a little later in the show. As a former Youth Salute student and scholarship winner, it's an absolute honor to take part once again in this incredible program. We first want to take a moment to recognize Asbury University for their willingness to host this year's event with Eastern Kentucky University, 
Georgetown College and Transylvania University. Together, you are creating a much greater opportunity in scholarships and other awards for a deserving group of high school leaders. Your hospitality is greatly appreciated. Today presents us with a rare opportunity to recognize more than 800 outstanding leaders from 58 high schools across Central Kentucky. You are now part of an elite group of students across the country being recognized by the National Council on Youth Leadership. Young people need applause. It demonstrates the approval of their peers and communities in which they live in. They need role models they can admire and emulate. The recognition we give to our young men and women today serves as a powerful inspiration that can shape their behavior in the future. Today, we're here to offer that applause. The Central Kentucky Council on Youth Leadership started recognizing outstanding youth leaders in 1981. Over the past 40 years, more than 26,000 students have received the distinction of being recognized as an outstanding youth leader through the Youth Salute program. The council makes every effort to raise community awareness about these young leaders' accomplishments. We want to congratulate all our youth leaders, their parents and grandparents today. We also want to thank their guidance counselors, teachers and principals for nominating these outstanding students. Now, please join me in welcoming WKYT's Amber Philpott, who will be helping me present this year's awards. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you for having me here today. I'm a proud alum of the Youth Salute program, so I am honored to be here with you today, honoring so many of you out there. We believe that every student being recognized in the Youth Salute program is very special. Each student leader was sent an individual award certificate as part of their invitation email. Uh, once the document is downloaded, the student can type their name on it and then print it out. So we say congratulations to each of you here today. We also want to thank the following Central Kentucky patrons who contributed to the Scholarship and Awards Fund. Asbury University, Central Bank and Trust, Class 101, Eastern Kentucky University, Georgetown College, Hollifield Photography, Transylvania University, and the Central Kentucky Council on Youth Leadership, Scholarship, and the Awards Committee. I do want to quickly put out a blanket. I'm sorry, we didn't get pronunciations ahead of time, so I don't mean to butcher your name. So we're going to do the best that we can as we get through these. But we want to say congratulations, whether we mess your name up or not. We certainly don't mean to do that. Based on the selection of the Central Kentucky Scholarship and Awards Committee, the top youth leader from each high school for 2020 will now be named. We begin in Anderson County. Monita Kim. Bath County, Krista Stump, Berea Community, Coleman Reed, Bourbon County, Will Wyatt, Boyle County, Kaylee Witzel, Bracken County, Dustin Tucker, Bryan Station, Victoria Lowe, Bergen Independent, Eliza Marsh, Carter G. Woodson Academy, Sydney Stewart, and Casey County, Morgan Crow. For Christian Academy of Lawrenceburg, the winner is Erica Hickman. Danville, Faith Breitenbach. East Jessman, Gavin Carr. Estill County, Summer Evans. Fleming County, James Hall. Frankfurt Christian Academy, Morgan Monroe. Frankfurt, Tyler Baker. Franklin County, Landon Good. Frederick Douglas, Bryson Berry. And Garrett County, Abigail Isaacs. George Rogers Clark, Ashlyn Brookshire, Great Crossing, K Catherine Brown, Harrison County, Marshall Knupp, Henry Clay, Taylor Galvalotti, Henry County, Rachel Topp, Homeschools, Isaac Adams, Kentucky School for the Deaf, Elizabeth Holcomb, Lafayette, Henna Cottru. Lewis County, Madison Welch, and Lexington Catholic, Abigail Rowe. For Lexington Christian Academy, Logan Martin, Lincoln County, Baylor Mattingly, Madison Central, Abigail McAvoy, Madison Southern, Chloe Osborne, Menifee County, Dylan Adams, Mercer County, Rebecca Trent, Model Lab, Everett Parker Noblet, Montgomery County, Austin Stegall, Nicholas County,
Hannah Albright and Owen County, Carson Inman. Paris, Kimberly Faulkner. Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Rashida Santanam. Powell County, Destiny Randall. Pulaski County, Shelby Black. Rowan County, Jacob Blevins. Sayre School, Alexis Henry. Scott County, Emily Spencer. Shelby County, Claire Chambers. Somerset, Anna Marie Gullick. Somerset Christian School, Hannah Monsanto. Spencer County, Kerrigan Lee. Summit Christian Academy, Sophia Roberts. Tates Creek, Charles Wilson. Trinity Christian Academy, Jocelyn Okerley. Washington County, Lynn Tormelin. West Jessman, Macy Lane Brockman. Western Hills, Harper Lee Heffley. And Woodford County, Claire Pinkston. Congratulations to all of our winners. Class 101, a college finance and planning company, has been a longtime patron of the Youth Salute program. Class 101 is providing a $500 scholarship this year, and the winner is Rob Gilligan from Henry Clay High School. Congratulations. Central Bank and Trust Company is providing four $125 awards to our national ambassadors. In addition, each student will also receive an access pass to the online national leadership program courtesy of Hollifield Photography. And this year's national ambassadors are Macy Lane Brockman from West Jessamine High School, Marshall Knupp from Harrison County High School, Hannah Albright from Nicholas County High School, and Morgan Crow from Casey County High School. Congratulations. Hollifield Photography is providing a $500 scholarship, the Star Award, and an access pass to the online National Leadership Program to this year's 2020 Central Kentucky Youth Leaders of the Year. The winners are Claire Pinkston from Woodford County High School and Bryson Ferry from Frederick Douglass. And now for our final awards. All youth leaders who were seriously interested in attending Asbury University, Eastern Kentucky University, Georgetown College, or Transylvania University were asked to submit their name for scholarship consideration, along with a registration for today's event. A separate committee from each college has reviewed the nomination forms and essays, and they've made a final decision. Asbury University has generously hosted the Youth Salute event today. Asbury spent countless hours putting together an informative online leadership program for students this afternoon. In addition, they are providing five $4,000 scholarships today. And those winners are Lucy Singleton, Lincoln County, Malia Crump, Frederick Douglass, Isabella Freeman, Madison Central, Jackson Feeback, George Rogers Clark, and Ania Booten, Mercer County. Congratulations. Eastern Kentucky University has generously hosted the Youth Salute event in the past. Today, they're providing five $4,000 scholarships. The winners are Abby Brewer from Madison Central, Alexander Nichols, Frederick Douglass, Winter Bailey, Henry Clay, Nathan Fees, Model Lab, and Caitlin Scales, Wes Jessman. Georgetown College has generously hosted the Youth Salute event in the past as well. In addition, they are providing five $4,000 scholarships today as well. And the winners are Luis Garza, Paris, Emery Lucas, Madison Central, Natalie Pauley, Frederick Douglass, Anna Williams, Anderson County, and Megan Griffith, Harrison County. Congratulations. Another school that's generously hosted the Youth Salute event in the past is Transylvania University. They're providing five $4,000 scholarships today. And the winners are Haviland Harris, Franklin County High School, Alexis Henry, Sayre School, Amber Kern, Harrison County High School, Annalise Mork, George Rogers Clark High School, and Morgan Thomas, Madison Central High School. 
And with that, we conclude our program. Once again, we want to thank Asbury University for hosting the 2020 Youth Salute event. A little bit different this year, but they certainly still made it happen for us. Scholarship and award letters will be mailed to winners by the colleges and Hollifield Photography. On behalf of Andrea Walker and myself, thank you. Have a good afternoon and congratulations to all of our winners.